could have stayed up here and preached. It had been all right, Ty. Uh, well, I've already been blessed this week with so much encouragement. Lots of memories. Lots of good things that have uh, strengthened and edified me. And tonight we have a wonderful group of people, children of God, who have come together to open our Bibles and to try to learn some things together. I love spending this 30 minutes in, in song and praise to God and encouragement to one another. Todd is such a blessing to God's cause. Every year in February when he comes down for lectures, we always get him to lead for us. And the people love it because he takes our heart before the throne of God so effectively. And we gain so much from it. I mentioned several things about the College View Church last night, about uh, my history with it. But uh, you have continued to have a history with me. One thing I didn't mention last night was that last year this church had fellowship with me and my work in Ethiopia. I go annually over there. And last year uh, I did not know I was going to the last minute, but the elders here responded in a plea from me to help me to be able to go, and they did that. And I'm so grateful for that. Being involved in the work in Ethiopia has been, uh, for me, such an encouragement because it's one of the most amazing things I've seen happen happening in the kingdom of God on earth today. And uh, I'm thankful that I can be a part of that. And I'm thankful that you have had fellowship in that work also. Our theme this time is strengthening our spirit. And I like that theme. Because it does talk about the thing we need every day of our Christian life. Finding strength to serve God in the way that uh, God wants us to do that. In relation to that, my topic this week has been related to true spirituality. Talking last night about you who are spiritual. As we talk about defining spirituality, not as a feeling that we have, but as the character of the Christian that you who are spiritual are those who are growing in Christ, maturing in Christ, living for him day by day, obeying his word. Those are spiritual people. That's what we are defined by, not by uh, the feeling that we may have in our heart. So spirituality is certainly important. It's important that we understand that. And the means for becoming more spiritual is to grow in Christ through knowing the will of God, to know the scriptures. God wants us to be wise unto salvation, 2 Timothy 3 and verse 15. And wisdom is certainly a recurring topic in scripture. And seeking spiritual wisdom is certainly something we should be committed to doing. We are taught to seek spiritual wisdom. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 9. The Apostle Paul said, For this reason we also, since the day we heard it, do not cease to pray for you and to ask that you may be filled with the knowledge of his will in all wisdom and spiritual understanding. God speaks of the wisdom that we are to have and that we are to seek in 1 Corinthians chapter 2. In verse 7 he said, as they apostles, he said, we speak the wisdom of God in a mystery. The hidden wisdom of God, which God ordained before the ages for our glory. So there is a wisdom of God that is revealed. There is a wisdom of God that even a part of had been a mystery for a time, but now is made known and which is identified by Paul in Ephesians 3 and other places as the gospel itself, the good news of Jesus Christ, which had been hidden before, but now has been made known. And in that also we've seen the wisdom of God. Well, today there is desire for wisdom. Even those that are searching for spirituality today, who are out in the world, who do not have the concept of true spirituality, they are seeking for wisdom and guidance in their spirituality. They are seeking more than just a feeling. They are seeking to find within themselves some means then of having guidance in their life where they will find peace and contentment. And so they are searching for this. People have an emptiness within themselves that they're trying to fill. And so they begin to search in their spiritual search for the wisdom that will guide them and that will direct them. But where is the world looking for this? 
Well, too often they're looking to the spiritual gurus out there, the holy men of the East, and all these sources of wisdom that are talked about today. Yan Mio was born in mainland China into a family with a rich Chinese and Tibetan spiritual heritage. Her Chinese grandfather was a Zen master. Her grandmother, whose name means Oceans of Wisdom, was the daughter of a high Tibetan respected Lama. And she herself is believed to be an enlightened master deeply connected to the Divine Mother. Here's what she says about finding wisdom. She says that spiritual wisdom comes from a lifetime of learning the experiences we have when we search inside herself, ourselves. And that what we must do is to search for this basic divine wisdom. She says it is not outside. Uh, and we search within ourselves, not outside, and begin to reconnect with our perfect essential essence. The, in, the infinite wisdom we are seeking is already within. Now, here she talks about exploring the practices that entails going beyond all concepts, going directly to the source, she says. Creation and cultivation of direct personal experience, she says, takes precedence over reading and studying spiritual texts and scriptures. Where is spiritual wisdom found? It's already inside you. You've just got to tie into that. You've got to find it within yourself. It is not out in the world. It's not something you're going to discover out there. You're going to have to find it within yourself. Larry Culliford wrote a best-selling book called Seeking Wisdom, a Spiritual Manifesto. He tries to give us the solution to world problems also. He says, the solution to the world's problems then is for each person so moved, whether by rational argument or through intuitive wisdom, to adopt a personal or spiritual development plan or program working towards experiencing close kinship, a deep and seamless feeling of connection with the entirety of humanity, past, present, and to come, to feel the same degree of loving intimacy with all living creatures, with the varied and precious landscapes and seascapes of our beautiful home planet, and with the greater universe beyond, opening up in joy and freedom to the sacred, all-powerful, unifying principle, the breath, the life force, or cosmic energy that some are pleased to call the Holy Spirit of God. Now go do that. I don't get that. <laughs> but it is an example of how people today are seeking wisdom. They want wisdom and are listening to these people who are telling them, you've already got it. It's inside you. Finding within yourself the true self is what is going to guide you and help you to find the true wisdom. And out of that comes their concept of spirituality. That they are finding within themselves, uh, they are discovering in themselves this peace of mind, this contentment that makes them feel spiritual. And they believe is giving direction to their life. Well, like the term spirituality, the phrase spiritual wisdom is used a lot today. It's not new. It's a search that's been going on for years. You can almost mark the time in American culture when our culture began to turn to new sources for wisdom and spiritual guidance. And I hate to say, it was my generation. The generation of the 60s. The generation of the 60s was a, a cultural upheaval that changed the course of our country for a long time, even to this day. It was a time of the introduction of Timothy Leary and the new drug culture. The idea that by using psychedelic drugs you could discover new truth and understanding about yourself that uh, you would never discover in any other way. You turn on and you tune out 
You rebel against the society and the culture, and you find truth within yourself. Part of that was the result of the, the upheaval because of the uh, division over the support of the Vietnam War. But during that time, there were those who were in influential positions in our culture who began to turn to separate ideas or sources of wisdom. I know I'm old, but I'm still pretty sure everybody in here knows who the Beatles were. The Beatles were the biggest rock group in history. I don't know of any other that was on the level of popularity that they were, unless it was Michael Jackson during, during the height of his career. But the Beatles had tremendous influence upon teenagers and young adults during their time as they went from just playing pop and rock music to music in which they began to uh, talk about searching within yourself and, and getting into this very idea. And the, result, the, the reason for that is they were exposed to the Eastern uh, practice of transcendental meditation. They ended up going to India to meet Maharishi Mahesh Yogi, who was a leading proponent of transcendental med meditation. Now, you have to understand, that didn't just affect the Beatles. All the young people in this culture, in this country, were watching that. All of them uh, were going through this rebellious time in which marijuana and its influence and other drugs were coming on the scene and believing that this opened your mind to new things and uh, the wisdom of the East was now uh, tied in with that and all of a sudden our culture changed tremendously. I saw it happen in my generation. And so people began to look for for this inside of wisdom in different places. I want to tell you about a personal example of this. I lived in, I grew up in Lawrenceburg, Tennessee, which is not far from here. And uh, that's where we were living in the 60s. And during that time, there was a man named Stephen Gaskin who taught uh, as a, actually an English professor in a university in San Francisco and, and uh, was greatly influencing the group in the Haight-Ashbury district at that time, which was the center of hippies. But he began to teach things far beyond just English lit. His class came to be called the Monday night class. And there were literally thousands of, of young people that would come to his class. They were listening to him for a source of wisdom. And uh, as a result, he developed such a cult following that he decided he wanted to start a commune. They didn't know where. They had 60 school buses, all painted with flowers and psychedelic cutters, and they took off across the United States to find a place where they could start their own commune. And they ended up just outside of Summertown, Tennessee. I don't know why they chose that, but that's Lawrence County. And it was just up the road from us. And I think about the culture shock that was for Lawrence County, and particularly for Summertown, which was a town of about 3,500. But Gaskin would explain about how he sought and found the wisdom by which he was trying to lead his followers. I remember how he described it. He said, it's like taking a deck of, of computer data cards. Now, for you young people, this is the way they used to put information in the mainframe computers. There were punch key operators and holes were punched into these cards that then the computer would read and the location of those, those holes would indicate certain data that would be entered. And so you would take a stack, you would create a stack of data cards and then you would feed them into the computer to get the programs into it. And he said, really what I do is I take uh, all the wisdom of the world and I take these like they're data cards and I stack them and I line them up and wherever there's a hole that goes all the way through all of them that means that's where all the true wisdom is because all the wise people of the world share that viewer idea. So he said I've just found all the great wisdom and I'm going to share it with you because I found all the right holes in the data cards. But this was the mindset of my culture, of my generation at that time. And it really began to turn uh, a generation and the next generation after that 
to looking for wisdom and outside, inside, outside of what had been the traditional source, which was the Word of God. And that truly is regrettable. We do need to define wisdom. Where is true wisdom going to be found? Well, of course, for us, our emphasis is upon the centrality of God's Word to everything in this world. God spoke the world into existence. He opposed the world by the word of his power, it says in Hebrews 1 and verse 3. He reveals himself through his creation. He reveals his will and his wisdom to us through his inspired word, confirmed to us by the powers and signs and wonders that accompanied its revelation. As a result, we believe that true wisdom is found only in one place, and that is in God's word, the Bible. That's the only place. We then need to define true spiritual wisdom as found in scriptures. Then we understand how we not only seek it, but we put it into practical, practical use in our daily lives. In the, whole, in the uh, Hebrew Old Testament, there are many Hebrew words that are translated by the phrase or, or the word wisdom. And obviously no one English word will cover all these different uses. But the general meaning is pretty clear. I like this phrase. It is the art of reaching one's end by the use of right means. That there is a way to understand how to reach the right end. But you have to use the right means to get there. In the International Standard Bible Encyclopedia, the writer is speaking of the wise men of the Old Testament in Scripture. And in describing them, he says, In religion, the wise man is he who gives to the things of God the same acuteness that other men give to worldly affairs. The wise men of Scripture are the ones who understand that they must commit themselves to understanding the wisdom of God, just as those of the world are more interested in finding what is offered by the world. He, the wise man of the Old Testament is usually distinguished from the prophets as not necessarily having personal inspiration, but knowing that is where true wisdom begins. Proverbs 1 and verse 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge, and fools despise wisdom and instruction. He understands that. But what he also understands is that true wisdom is always rooted in the Word of God. It is found in the Bible. This is a fundamental principle. Maybe we think this is obvious. But we take this for granted. But we must understand this principle and the meaning of it and how we explain it so we can answer those who trust in the wisdom of the world. We have to think this through. If we're going to be able to defend what we believe about true wisdom. But again... What we think of as wisdom or wisdom literature, we often think of as, well, just wise sayings about daily life and that uh, really what you have in the Old Testament is God had some man gather up all these sayings that uh, they heard in everyday life and put them in one place and by divine inspiration, he put them there so that we could know all of these things. But all the wisdom of the Proverbs, for example, every statement, is rooted in a clear biblical principle or even a specific law stated in God's Word. All of it is rooted in the Word and the will of God. It's not separated from it. These words, these wise words, are directly or indirectly applications of the wisdom of God that has been revealed. But they are applications to everyday life situations. Proverbs 21, 9. It's better to live in the corner of a housetop than in a house shared with a quarrelsome wife. Now, for some reason, that's in there twice. Now, I, I didn't do it, you know, but it's in there twice. But he's simply applying a principle explaining where someone is missing what the marriage relationship should be about, as is taught in Scripture. The father in Proverbs chapter 5 is telling to his son that there's 
the woman that he should stay away from, the immoral woman. For he says, for the lips of a forbidden woman drip honey, and her speech is smoother than oil. But in the end, she's as bitter as wormwood, sharp as a two-edged sword. Son, flee fornication. That's what he's talking about there, the clear biblical teaching. The wise man in Ecclesiastes, I have seen everything that is done under the sun, and behold, all is vanity and a striving after wind. Russ talked about this morning, about people, uh, all of us, they become so wrapped up in the material things, the material things of this world. And he's saying, that's not what it's about. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. That's what he's saying here. Yet I am constantly amazed how even those who claim to be religious leaders today think that they have a wisdom that goes beyond what the scriptures teach. Pope Francis is shaking up the Catholic Church with his recent statements regarding homosexuality, divorce, and even, interestingly, his almost total silence during the recent vote in Ireland on the constitutionality of abortion, which was passed overwhelmingly. All of these things in direct conflict with the teaching of the Word of God. But he's the Pope. I remember when I was in high school and in college, I, what seemed to me the most popular graduation gift in the 70s was Khalil Gibran's The Prophet. An interesting book. Gibran was a counterculture, a counterculture poet and philosopher and artist whose literary works have only been outsold by two other literary uh, figures, Shakespeare and Laozi, who founded Eastern Taoism. Gibran's work come third. That's amazing to me. And, you know, they say some good things. In fact, the good things you find them saying, really, when you look at it, is a biblical principle. They may not realize that, but they've stumbled on something. You know, the old saying about Blind hog stumbles on an acorn every now and then. Well, I, they may not know the Word of God, but every now and then they'll stumble on something that works, and it's found in the Word of God. But we must understand, if they claim it's wisdom, but it's not based upon something in Scripture, it is not God's wisdom. And we need to be careful about trusting it and trusting the source. Wisdom rightly gets a, a strong biblical emphasis in Scripture, but it is never wisdom separated from God's Word. I think this is emphasized in many ways. One is that you see these Proverbs, who we think of, again, as just interesting sayings or ideas that the world discovered and somebody collected. No, the Proverbs are quoted in the New Testament and referred to as Scripture. Romans 12, verse 19. Beloved, never avenge yourselves, but leave it to the wrath of God. For it is written, Vengeance is mine, I will repay, says the Lord. To the contrary, if your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he's thirsty, give him something to drink. For by so doing, you will heap burning coals on his head. That's almost a direct quotation from Proverbs 25 and verse 21. Hebrews 12 and verse 5. My son, do not regard lightly the discipline of the Lord, nor be, nor be weary when reproved by him. For the Lord disciplines the one he loves and chastises every son whom he receives. Quotation from Proverbs chapter 3, verses 11 and 12. 2 Peter 2 and verse 22, where when he's talking about the child of God that's turned back into the world, he says what the truth of Proverbs says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. Proverbs 26 and verse 11. The wisdom statements of Proverbs, Ecclesiastes, Song of Solomon, is Scripture. It's not just a collection of sayings. It is Scripture. And every single proverb, every... Uh, idea expressed in those books is rooted in the wisdom and the will and the word of God. And that's what makes them wise. They're good practical applications. They're good illustrations. They teach us things. But understand, this is where true wisdom is found. 
you know, it's important to see, I think, that wisdom is, the term wisdom itself is used to refer to knowledge of God's revealed word. Paul describes God's inspired word as God's wisdom. In 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 6, Yet among the mature we do impart wisdom, he says. Wisdom we're imparting. Although it is not a wisdom of this age or the rulers of this age who are doomed to pass away, but we impart a secret and hidden wisdom of God which God decreed before the ages for our glory. None of the rulers of this age understood this, for if they had, they would not have crucified the Lord of glory. But as it is written, what no eye has seen, nor ear heard, nor the heart of man imagined, what God has prepared for those who love him. He says what God has revealed for us is wisdom. It is the wisdom of God. And the good news of Jesus Christ is a manifestation of the wisdom of God. These things God has revealed to us through His Spirit. That mystery being made known. Our salvation in Jesus Christ. So the Spirit revealed divinely inspired, the divinely inspired Word of God that is God's wisdom. I think of Paul's glorious declaration at the end of Romans chapter 11. What he said in verse 33. Oh, the depth of the riches and the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and how inscrutable his ways. For who has known the mind of the Lord or who has been his counselor? The wisdom of God is so great, he says, that no one can tell God. No one can give God counsel. Well, Job teaches us that. <laughs> Job's friends... Uh, told Job, if you've done nothing wrong, then you need to talk to God about this. You've got an argument. You ought to demand an audience with God. You ought to challenge him. And they convinced him, and he got his audience. Because he thought he could counsel God about this matter and point out exactly where you'd gone wrong with me, God. Well, it didn't work out that way. He discovered the foolishness of challenging the wisdom of God. That the wisdom of God far exceeded him. And that he was willing to humble himself, even though he still did not understand the reasoning of all that God did. We do not counsel God because all ultimate wisdom lies in God and it's revealed from the mind of God through his word. We must never forget that the wisdom of the world is foolishness to God. The foundation of all true wisdom is always his revealed word. It's wonderful that the best wisdom available to all of us can actually be found in one book. It's all put together for us. That we have that source of the wisdom of God for us. But we do then need to seek this spiritual wisdom. How do we seek spiritual wisdom? Well, they're all related to the Word of God, but let me suggest really what even I think the Proverbs suggest to us about how we learn these things. We seek spiritual wisdom, first of all, by going to the source of all true wisdom. Obviously, we go to God's inspired Word. You cannot be considered wise if you do not know the wisdom of God. And that wisdom does include... All this practical wisdom that we find in Job and Psalms and Proverbs and Ecclesiastes and the Song of Solomon, there is no better source. And we recognize that the wisdom that we are reading is not wisdom that has been expressed by the gurus or the Dalai Lama or the Occidental wise men. This is from the wise man who gives the things of God the same acuteness that other men give to worldly affairs. <coughs> All true wisdom begins with the Word of God. If you want to be wise, you better be spending a lot of time in Scripture. But we also seek this spiritual wisdom by listening to Christians who have already had many years of life experience as Christians. 
The idea of setting an example before others is, is found throughout Scripture. Paul urging Timothy to set an example to others in speech, in conduct, in love, in faith, and in purity in 1 Timothy chapter 4. But in mature Christians, what do we find? In mature Christians, you find those who have observed how obedience and disobedience to God's teaching has played out in their own lives and in the lives of others. They spent a lifetime seeking to be spiritual people, and they've experienced life, and they've seen it, both for good and for bad. They've seen the good in others and the mistakes in others. They've seen the good in themselves, and they've seen the mistakes in themselves all held up against the mirror of God's Word and coming to understand what is best. And the wisdom of listening to them is so important. I've learned a lot from watching older preachers, men who had learned basic principles. My uh, sister-in-law's father, Bill Lewis, gospel preacher from a previous generation, was an interesting fellow. I learned a couple of things from him. One was, he taught me the importance of being concise in what you presented. His lessons were short. I haven't learned that lesson real well. But his lessons were always concise. Something else he taught me was, uh, we were visiting someone together in the hospital. And as we were walking out, he said, we've got to take a detour here. I said, what is it? He said, son, never leave a hospital without washing your hands. <laughs> Basic sanitary principle from Leviticus, I think, if we go back and look. But learn that, never, never violate that principle. But you learn from older preachers and from elders, those who have had experience about being patient with brothers and sisters who are struggling and who are weak, that you show long-suffering and patience with them and going through that. Something that, as a young preacher, I didn't always want to do. I really didn't. But certainly then you learn by your own life experience as you are seeking to know and to serve God. You make your own observations about your own life and the lives of others. And you learn from it. The classic statement about this is by Laban and back in Genesis 30 and verse 27 when he finds out that Jacob's about to leave. And he doesn't want to leave because he knows why he's prospered with Jacob there and Laban says to him please stay if I found favor in your eyes for I've learned by experience that the Lord has blessed me for your sake he observed God blessed the righteous man and even if he didn't want to be a righteous man he wanted him to stay around because he saw God did bless the righteous well we ought to learn to observe I've learned a lot as a preacher I still got a lot to learn I can remember as a young man that uh, if there's a problem in the church, well, I just go home and work a sermon on it. You know, I come back and preach it, and I say, well, okay, that's taken care of. Well, it never seemed to work that way. Problem didn't go away, and uh, it would take a while to deal with that. And I had to learn that, you know, this is something that you have to do over time with patience to work on problems and to get them worked out. I remember an article I read by Guthrie Dean who was a character in himself. And he talked about how he had a, a member in the congregation and he had worked up a sermon, really, that was aimed for him. And that he had worked hard on that and he knew he was going to get through to this guy with this lesson. And so he got up and preached that lesson with fervor. And so he's standing at the back as everyone's coming out and he says he had a dozen people come out and say, boy, you really got me with that lesson. You really hit me. I, I'm so glad you preached that. I felt like you were really preaching to me. And then the guy comes out who he was preaching to, and he says, boy, you really got them today. They, they needed that. I know all kinds of people in here who needed that lesson. And Guthrie said he thought to himself, and he says, you know, I missed my target and ricocheted all over the assembly. <laughs> and that happens sometimes. And you have to understand the patience in preaching the word of God. You know, Ezekiel was told by God in Ezekiel 3 and verse 7, he said, the house of Israel will not be willing to listen to you. For they're not willing to listen to me because all the house of Israel have a hard forehead and a stubborn heart. Well, I don't think all Christians are that way. But I've met a few. And it is a struggle in dealing with that. But 
A preacher better learn to preach and teach the word with all long suffering and teaching. And nothing teaches you that like life's experience. But those are biblical principles that are already there if I would have paid attention. But I had to learn them by experience. I used to think when I was a young preacher that, you know, when someone lost a husband or a wife or a mother or a child, that, you know, after that had happened, that they wouldn't want to talk about that. And I try to avoid the subject around that. I finally learned that's not true. They want to talk about it. They want to share those things about them usually and to be able to pour out those things. But I didn't get that. But by experience, I began to pick that up and other preachers point out to me and show me those kinds of things. I learned experiences then as a preacher. I learned experiences in my marriage that uh, really were biblical principles I should have already, already learned. I want to tell some of you young men, if you hadn't married, if you're just married, you know, so young in your life, I want to tell you something, and you can take this to the bank, that this is true. Never buy your wife a vacuum cleaner for Mother's Day. Okay? Now that doesn't work. Uh, now, I've got an explanation for that if you want to hear it, but I'm not going to tell it right now. But she saw that vacuum cleaner, and it was all over. Uh, but I should have learned to dwell with my wife in an understanding way or according to knowledge. I should have understood that wasn't going to go over if I understood her. But that's a biblical principle. And you learn things like that as you go along in life. And certainly there are experiences with brethren I've learned through the years. Things that, again, the scriptures taught. I have learned unlimited lessons from general business meetings without elders about dealing with brethren and how to work through problems and all those kinds of things. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 13 and verse 11, finally, brothers, rejoice. But aim for restoration. Comfort one another. Agree with one another. Live in peace. And the God of peace shall be with you. Well, if brethren can apply those principles in working out the work of the Lord in those situations, things are going to go. They're going to go a lot better if we do that. Life teaches us lessons. But usually, if we had been deep in the Word of God, we would have already understood a lot of those things. Because all practical, good wisdom is rooted in the Word of God and what it says. That is where true wisdom is found. And so the result is, is wisdom produces fruit. James 3 and verse 17. But the wisdom from above is first pure, then peaceable, gentle, open to reason, full of mercy and good fruits, impartial and sincere. And the harvest of righteousness is sown in peace by those who make peace. This is actually a description of what God's wisdom in our life produces. That these are the things that are the result of learning and applying and practicing the wisdom of God. And if we are seeking God's wisdom and we're practicing God's wisdom, these are the things that will be true about us and the influence that we would have. Well, the world thinks they know all wisdom and they write about it constantly. I can't help but think of the statement of the wise men in Ecclesiastes 12 and verse 12. My son, beware of anything beyond these. He said, of making many books, there is no end. And much study is a weariness of the flesh. Had that impressed upon me in a special way here recently. My wife and I were in Dublin, Ireland. And we went down to the Trinity College, to Trinity College Library. We went to see the Book of Kells, which is an amazing illuminated manuscript from 800 A.D. Of, of, of Scripture. And it was an amazing thing to see. But as we were leaving the room where it was, there was a staircase over there, and there was this little sign with an arrow pointing up the staircase, and it said, The Long Room. 
I said, well, I wonder what that is. And so Pamela said, well, let's go find out what it is. And so we go up the steps. We turn to the right. And this is what we see. The long room in Trinity College. It's over 200 feet long. It was built between 1712 and 1732. It came to be the repository of every book that was published in Britain and Ireland beginning in 1801. After several expansions, it filled a capacity after about 100 years, and all the later books are kept off site. But this room contains over 200,000 volumes in a room 70 yards long. Well, to a bibliophile, it brings tears to your eyes when you see it. You just want to go down and see what's in this, this bookshelf and that one. It was absolutely an overwhelming experience for me. But I looked at that and I thought, this is only a drop in the bucket of the books of which men have published, of which there is no end. Most of those books are filled with man's wisdom and not God's. The words of the wise are like goats, and like nails firmly fixed are the collected sayings. They are given by one shepherd. Ecclesiastes 12 and 11. True wisdom, like well-fastened nails, he says, they come from the one shepherd. True wisdom is found only in the word of God. And so we understand better that closing statement to Ecclesiastes. The end of the matter, all has been heard. Fear God. Keep his commandments. Keep his will, his word. For that is the whole duty of man. God will bring every deed into judgment with every secret thing, whether good or evil. Whatever we learn from experience of life, make sure we are rooting our wisdom in the wisdom of God from the good shepherd who supplies all things. Thank you.